His Excellency High Representative, Mr. Joseph Borrell, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to first and foremost express my appreciation to the European Union and of course to the consortium for inviting me to speak today and for holding this conference under what can be best described as very difficult circumstances. The European Union and its member states are amongst the staunchest defenders of the global disarmament and non-proliferation regime. It is a commitment that is reflected in both word and deed as key political and financial supporters of initiatives to achieve these ends. We are so grateful for the European Union's commitment and also generosity. I have been asked today to co comment on the state of that regime. That is the web of multilateral, plurilateral, bilateral, and even unilateral instruments, uh, arrangements, norms, and also policies that seek to eliminate weapons of mass destruction, strictly regulate conventional weapons, and ensure that new means and methods of warfare are consistent with international law. Speaking frankly, this regime is under stress. During the relationship between major powers, historic levels of military spending, the emergence of disruptive technologies and potential new domains of conflict and the growing threat to civilians from increasingly powerful weapons are all placing increased pressure on the regime. The risks posed by nuclear weapons, which remains the United Nations highest disarmament priority, are greater than they have been since the height of the Cold War. Factors driving these risks include the growing role of nuclear weapons in national security strategies, a return to dangerous concepts such as nuclear war fighting, and the intersection between technological advancements and nuclear weapons. The bilateral control, uh, arms control regimes is eroding and the disarmament machinery remains paralyzed. On the more positive note, the impeding entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or TPNW highlights the enduring commitment of many states to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Likewise, the much needed renewal of dialogue between the United States and the Russian Federation is a welcome development. The NPT Review Conference, now further postponed until next August next year, faces many challenges, but states parties now have an opportunity to use this extra time to lay the ground for successful outcome that strengthens the treaty and by extension, the regime. Ongoing divisions over how to respond to the alleged use of chemical weapons threaten to undermine the taboo against these inhuman, inhumane uh, weapons and the Chemical Weapons Convention. I take this opportunity to once again reaffirm my full support for the integrity, professionalism, impartiality, objectivity, and independence of the work of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW, and to echo Secretary General Guterres's position that there is no justification for the use of chemical weapons by anyone, anywhere, and under any circumstances. Those who have used chemical weapons must be identified and held to account. As the uh, arbiters of international peace and security, it is the responsibility of the United Nations Security Council to show unity and leadership on this matter. The current COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the global disruption that infectious disease uh, can cause and the worrisome lack of preparedness at the national, regional, and international levels. A disease deliberately manipulated to be more virulent, 
or one intentionally released in multiple venues at the same time would lead to an even more serious global crisis. In order to improve preparedness and response for the future threats, serious attention needs to be devoted to preventing this potential catastrophe. The Biological Weapons Convention, BWC, remains the key instrument to prevent the deliberate use of bioweapons. Although the BWC has established a strong norm against the use of these potentially catastrophic weapons, it lacks an oversight institution, contains no verification provisions, and does not have an operationalized mechanism to provide and deliver assistance. The ninth BWC review conference to be held in November next year, 2021, will be a critical forum for states parties to strengthen this increasingly relevant convention. The global outbreak of the COVID-19 has also posed new urgency to develop effective responses and solutions to combat the humanitarian impact of armed conflict. Sadly, too few have respected the Secretary General's call for the immediate cessation of hostilities through a global ceasefire. Over 20,000 people have lost their lives to armed violence since the Security Council endorsed the call in July this year. The full implementation of existing frameworks and instruments, including the Program of Action on Small Arms and Light Weapons, POA, and the Arms Trade Treaty, ATT, is crucial to tackling the diversion of conventional web arms and ammunition, and therefore the devastating effects of, these, of the misuse of weapons, such as small arms and light weapons. The uh, upcoming seventh biannual meeting of states, uh, of states on the POA will provide a uh, platform for states to further strengthen small arms uh, control at the national, regional, and global levels. Matters arising include the Secretary General's recommendation for national target setting in the implementation of Program of Action, a supplementary annex to the international tracing instrument to address the impacts of new technologies in weapon design and addressing the diversion of arms and ammunition to unauthorized recipients. Practical arms control initiatives such as these require political leadership as well as flexible funding mechanisms. To catalyze such funding, in 2020, UNODA together with UNDP established the Saving Lives Entity or Salient, the United Nations Trust Facility Supporting Corporation on Arms Regulation or ANSCAR also continues to support our efforts for quick impact initiatives. And I want to extend my sincere thanks to those European Union countries that have generously contributed to these initiatives and to invite others to consider doing likewise. As I mentioned, the potential misuse or unintended consequences of technological advances are placing increased pressure on the disarmament and non-proliferation regime due to the absence of guardrails to prevent this. As this conference has recognized, a key example is the potential implications of the increasing use of artificial intelligence in critical functions of weapons. These developments have the potential to trigger arms competition, lower thresholds for the use of force, and contribute to crisis instability. They could challenge existing legal frameworks and raise questions about safeguarding the sanctity of human life. Intergovernmental deliberations at the CCW on the possible need to regulate or restrict levels of autonomy in the critical functions of weapon systems have made significant progress. But despite new consensus on the principles 
that humans must retain control over weapons and the use of force. Agreement on how best to ensure this base requirement remains elusive. In the absence of uh, common standards and understandings on how international law applies, we risk seeing the operation of autonomous weapon systems that cannot be used in conformity with humanitarian principles or dictate of public conscience. Similarly, it is imperative that normative framework agreed to within the United Nations on responsible state behavior in cyberspace continues to be built upon and also adhered to. COVID-19 has uh, considerable, has had considerable implications on cybersecurity as increased reliance on digital technologies has exacerbated vulnerabilities in ICT products and services. There have been reported spikes in spear phishing attacks and suspicious COVID-19 related websites since the start of the pandemic. Cyber operations have also targeted critical infrastructure such as hospitals, medical research facilities and other essential services, including the World Health Organization. In such an environment, ensuring the success of the two ongoing intergovernmental cyber processes is vital. This is now, um, this is a brief to the horizon of the state of the regime. Yet it highlights that while the regime is under pressure, it also has the instruments and mechanisms to achieve its goals. But these instruments need to be fully implemented and also backed by member states. It also supports what the Secretary General has been saying for some time. There is a need for new thinking when it comes to disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control in the current context. The shifting tectonic plates of technology, the multipolarity have made the world a very different place from even a decade ago. This environment requires new approaches that build upon um, a great gain, that is built upon uh, the, the great gains we have made but also seek to address both challenges and opportunities of the moment. Such new approaches must also be informed by diverse perspectives and partnerships amongst different stakeholders. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored that global multi-stakeholder action is paramount to a safe and sustainable future. I applaud the efforts of the European Union to advance the full and equal participation of women in disarmament processes, to ensure the voices of the youth and civil society are heard, and to seek partnership with the private sector in developing solutions. A vibrant and viable future regime depends on this. I am convinced that through the thorough implementation of the existing commitments and by thinking creatively about how to meet emerging challenges, the international community can bolster the global regime and in turn strengthen our common security. I count on your leadership and support in this regard. I thank you very much for your attention and I, I am looking forward to the exchanges throughout this conference. Thank you. So many, many thanks, uh, Mrs. Nakamitsu for this uh, indeed uh, very comprehensive and insightful uh, uh, presentation, uh, which uh, I think uh, has added uh, other many interesting uh, elements to our debate. And uh, now the floor is open and you all have the opportunity to type uh, a question uh, on the right side of your, of your screen. I don't see at the moment uh, any question, if I'm right. And uh, uh, in this case, I would perhaps uh, um, 
use my privilege as uh, chairman to ask uh, a couple of first uh, questions. In particular, you mentioned uh, the challenge to the CWC regime. And uh, there is a debate, an ongoing debate, on how, uh, if and how it would be possible to introduce a new mechanism for uh, both con uh, assuring uh, better control and also possibly uh, imposing, <laughs> imposing uh, sanctions or punitive measures uh, to the violators, those who violate the uh, the convention. I would la like to ask you how do if you see that this is an na actual possibility, how the debate is uh, developing uh, on this front. And second, uh, um, it, this relates uh, particularly to a subject uh, I, I have mentioned in my welcome speech. Uh, we are discussing uh, um, the implication of the epidemic on arms control processes. I know that uh, within the, U, the UN, but also many NGOs uh, and uh, study centers uh, deeply discuss uh, this problem, which are, is multifaceted, of course, even in terms of the new perception of weapons. So uh, please, uh, um, uh, could, could you give us your view on how this debate is developing. Okay, um, the, the very first part of the first question, uh, um, your sound was a, a little bit unstable, but it was about the BWC, no? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as you know, there have been um, active consultations and discussions taking place um, within the framework of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, the first thing I would like to emphasize is that um, I have been saying to all states parties um, that this, the, the, you know, the level of um, um, energy and, and eagerness investment um, of uh, NPT states parties in terms of preparing for the NPT work gone has been very impressive. Uh, and that um, um, we need to do the same um, uh, for the BWC. Um, next year um, will be a, a very important opportunity for states parties to indeed strengthen the convention which many states parties now recognize as a critical component uh, of international security. Um, precisely because of what has happened or what has been happening still uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it, of course, um, you know, it, it's a very strong norm um, established by the convention, as I said in my initial remarks, but um, at the same time, the convention does not have an implementation uh, mechanism. Um, anything that will be uh, developed by uh, states parties uh, will have to be a combination of measures and, and balanced measures uh, that will involve uh, strengthening the uh, implementation mechanisms and also at the same time um, strengthening the aspects related to dealing with uh, uh, technological developments, also strengthening the aspects of assistance, international assistance uh, to states parties. Um, and, and so there will have to be a balanced uh, discussion uh, and proposals on, of uh, addressing all of those really acute uh, uh, necessity. And I must say, um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the interest and, and uh, eagerness of states parties have much increased uh, since the, the pandemic started. And we hope to be able to uh, support these uh, active um, discussions. Um, um, in the context of the, the uh, preparatory uh, processes uh, with the understanding uh, that uh, this has to be really uh, approached uh, with a, um, um, a very, uh, very much uh, important energy uh, and flexibility and, and political uh, commitment uh, to, to the, the, the common uh, objectives. Um, the pandemic, um, you know, has um, the second question, um, the implication of the pandemic and um, the new perception. I think uh, 
um, they they have been several different kinds of um, impacts that uh, COVID-19 has actually uh, put on arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation issues. One thing is that um, the lesson from the pandemic is that uh, in order for us to be able to tackle the global crisis, they, will only, uh, they can only be uh, global cooperation, international cooperation. Um, there is no, um, no other way uh, of uh, tackling these acute challenges. Um, while the, um, the stresses um, that I have uh, put forward to you uh, on the um, um, international uh, disarmament and arms control regime did not start with the with the pandemic. It was devo fare before. per vedere queste questioni. Yes. Non le vedo. Dove devo vedere? Non vedo niente. Sorry. Okay. Is that okay? Um, all right. Um, it, the, the stress factors did not start with the, with the pandemic. Um, they were there before and, and they were exacerbated uh, perhaps by uh, the pandemic. But there was also a, a, a strong recognition, um, for example, expressed by uh, many member states delegations um, at the most recent first committee uh, discussions this year um, that now is the time, in fact, to reinvigorate um, uh, multilateral conversations on those issues. Um, there is um, also um, acute awareness, recognition uh, of the need um, for all governments to spend uh, precious resources on um, tackling the pandemic challenges and also recovery from the pandemic. And therefore, uh, the military spending, um, the you know that has been, that has been on the rise uh, continuously up until now, uh, needs to be somehow uh, controlled. And, and pandemic in, indeed can be uh, an important opportunity to reverse this trend uh, because of the the, the fiscal uh, pressures that all governments will have. So there are. Um, some uh, opportunities that, that are um, in front of us. Uh, also another one that we have been um, um, emphasizing is the need to put the humans at the center of our security discourse at the security debate. So there are some uh, um, important uh, positive in implications of the pandemic. Um, with this, um, however, uh, the world is <clears throat> also shifting to um, a new kinds of warfare, a method of warfare being developed. Uh, as we speak. Um, I think it is now <clears throat> a, a really high time, a very important time to um, uh, start putting all these uh, different, um, 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 different uh, aspects of arms control um, uh, and, and weapon systems, uh, the, the, the technology aspect, the nuclear aspects, um, uh, outer space conversations, uh, the missiles conversations. Uh, there have been um, good work that have been done, good reflections, and, and in, in some cases, uh, progress uh, have been made in, in um, specific areas of those conversations. I think now is the time to actually uh, develop interlinkages between those various um, areas uh, and then understand the strategic, um, um, you know, um, way forward, um, which is what we have been uh, starting to sort of uh, socialize the idea of a, a need to have a, a new vision, a new approaches to arms control, uh, perhaps after we have gone through those important uh, review conferences next year, um, that will be a, a good uh, a opportunity for the international community to come together and start that sort of uh, strategic uh, conversations. And I count on uh, European Union's uh, leadership um, in, in those conversations, in, in those future conversations also. So many, many thanks. Uh, I think we have still uh, five minutes. I have three questions, so the, uh, but let me read, read them. Uh, the first uh, is the following, uh, arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament uh, Processes have uh, suffered uh, worrying uh, setbacks in recent, recent years. In your view, will this trend change with the new US administration? It's a very political question. <laughs> the second one is the to the UN, uh, again to you, uh, as the TPNW will enter into force, 
will the UN ODA refocus its outreach promotion efforts to the treaties universalization? Another, I think, challenging question. And third one, uh, what makes you assess that the existing multipolarity makes the world more dangerous than before? Please, you have the floor. Thank you. These are all very good questions, um, very difficult Indeed. questions. The first question related to uh, the United States, the uh, US has always been and, and will continue to be um, uh, a very important partner as uh, one of the military superpowers. Without the US um, um, partnership, uh, we would never, the world would never be able to um, make progress on arms control and disarmament efforts. Um, with um, um, the change in the administration, with, with the engagement change, um, they, you know, uh, as we read a, a public stated uh, policy agenda of uh, the, the, the president elect uh, so far, uh, they seem to be some important changes. Um, but uh, whatever that might happen, and when I, whenever um, those uh, changes will, might be implemented. Um, we are looking forward to continuing and also further increasing our close cooperation and, and, and partnership uh, in the very challenging work uh, of um, discussing, negotiating, exploring, um, um, and, and making uh, um, a pro progress uh, in these areas. The second, TPNW, um, it's, um, it will enter into force on 22nd of January next year. And I would like to uh, applaud all the um, state ratifying states and, and also civil society and, uh, um, and core groups that have negotiated this, um, uh, this uh, new treaty um, for their efforts um, to secure uh, the ratifications. The speed of ratifications, um, especially in the midst of this COVID-19 global crisis, uh, it took three and four months to, to, to secure 50. And that is actually at the same speed as um, 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 all the uh, other disarmament conventions that, that we have. Um, so um, it was not any slower than um, other instruments. Um, this reflects, as I said, um, the, uh, the importance that vast majority of um, states attach uh, on the importance of the uh, elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, they will continue with the universalization efforts uh, for the, the UN. Um, we are fully ready uh, to support the, um, the various responsibilities that is entrusted upon us uh, under the, the, the TPNW. And we are indeed starting to think about how exactly, uh, what will be the steps uh, and how exactly we should uh, carry out those uh, functions uh, in support of uh, the treaty and, and, and the ratifying states. And I, as I said, um, we, we must make sure that um, this uh, convention will be seen and, and uh, be, uh, you know, start to function as one of the instruments of the toolbox or the, the, uh, as part of the, the overall regime. And this is not something that will replace any other treaty. Um, and in fact, uh, our attention uh, is also uh, very much focused um, on the MPT review conference. Uh, this is a very important cornerstone of the regime. And, and we, we should also focus on um, um, achieving a successful conclusion of that um, as well. And, and I hope that TPNW will in fact contribute so, um, to, to that success of the MPT as well. Um, multipolarity. Um, um, I wonder if that will actually make the world more dangerous place, but it, it, uh, it, it does definitely uh, make things uh, very uh, complex and complicated. Um, I think uh, that's one of the reasons why we need to have um, you know, a very serious, serious uh, thinking process of what it is that we need to have in terms of new approaches. It is no longer um, just uh, um, a nuclear two superpowers, uh, but um, they are, uh, you know, more than two 
that needs to be um, um, really involved um, in, in those discussions. Um, they are also, you know, one of the things that we, 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 we see as a very important element is that um, increasing, uh, if you will, uh, regional tensions with nuclear uh, um, tones uh, behind it. Uh, of course, Northeast Asia, um, but there is, of course, the Middle East. Um, and those, uh, um, you know, those are also combined with uh, existing of existence of uh, regional military powers uh, and historical and new uh, uh, conflicts at the regional level. Uh, and if that is combined with, um, uh, of course, uh, nuclear overtone, of course, I, I forgot to mention the South Asia as well, um, you know, that would make um, uh, nuclear disarmament much more of a complex and complicated uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, but this is why I think we need to, um, again, um, make our um, increased efforts in thinking through uh, what are potentially uh, new approaches and additional approaches that we need to take uh, in nuclear disarmament. Many, many thanks. Uh, um, since you are providing us with such very interesting uh, insights, uh, I can resist the temptation, if you allow me, <laughs> to ask a couple other questions. Uh, from, from the audience. Uh, one has to do with the role of, that the AI can play uh, to create a, a clear role to nuclear disarmament. Uh, the second is uh, uh, the following, it's high chance the new start won't be extended in 2021. Would the UN or EDA be promoting a new bilateral AC agreement or focuses export on a multilateral one? And the third, the third question is what can UN, UN do to preserve the JCPOA since it is based on UN Security Council Resolution 2231? Uh, these are the three questions. Okay, uh, again, um, a list of good and, and difficult questions. Um, the first one, the, the implication of uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Um, as we all know, um, um, that one aspect, which is lethal autonomous weapon systems, the discussions within the context of the CCW uh, has actually been making a good progress. Um, you know, high contracting parties have agreed on the principle and they are now deliberate. And then, you know, the 11 uh, principles that they've figured out actually is a very good start uh, of um, uh, much more concrete discussions exactly how to uh, implement um, so called meaningful human control over use of force, uh, etc. Um, and I very much hope that this, uh, this will continue. This is one of the, the, the critical uh, priorities uh, for, for our office as well. But uh, the use of AI um, um, in a more broader sense or the more sort of broader implication of the AI um, uh, is uh, still um, the discussions on these issues uh, we think is still at a, a preliminary stage. And this is where we need to uh, start uh, making some uh, good reflections. Uh, for example, um, you know, um, what will happen if artificial intelligence is, uh, um, you know, uh, more broadly um, uh, utilized in command and control uh, systems and, and broader aspects of weaponry, um, the implications are quite enormous. Um, so I think um, the, the issues related to AI in general and their potential implications uh, will need to be now uh, reflected in a, in, a, in a much broader sense. And this is one of those issues um, which uh, we believe is the, 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 the key element of uh, a new vision, uh, new approaches, discussions. I think um, this is something that potentially will uh, entirely change the, the picture of um, uh, warfare. Um, in the years to come. So this is uh, quite critical. Uh, new start. Um, we, we think, uh, I mean, we continue to impress upon both uh, countries to extend new start. Uh, and uh, as the two countries are, uh, are continuing to, to engage on these issues, 
um, we believe um, that uh, they are fully aware of the importance, not just on um, the, the security of both countries, but also for the entire world, uh, the importance of the extension of New START. And, um, and I don't want to contemplate um, a, a scenario that it is not extended. So our positions from the United Nations uh, still remain that um, this is uh, of a critical priority for um, the security of both countries, but also uh, the global security. And I hope that will be the case. Um, uh, and again, um, the, the position of the UN on JCPOA also remain, uh, remain uh, unchanged. Um, we, um, we believe this is an important um, um, agreement. Um, we call on uh, remaining parties uh, to return to full, uh, full compliance. Uh, and, and we hope that, um, um, uh, and, and uh, I should actually obviously say that European Union has been really instrumental uh, in, um, uh, in the world's uh, um, efforts to preserve this uh, agreement. Uh, and, um, and I think the vast majority of the world also um, shares that view. And uh, I hope that uh, continuous efforts will be made um, also call upon uh, Iran to uh, return to full uh, compliance. I think it will be an important part of um, preserving uh, and return to uh, the JCPOA. Many, many thanks. Uh, so I, for your very outstanding uh, contribution, uh, a, a virtual applause on behalf of uh, the, the, our audience. So I, I think uh, you have provided us with so very insightful uh, elements to continue our discussion. Many, many thanks again.